The end game here is the prospect of war. Oh, yeah. If China makes a move on Taiwan. Given the strength of China, given what we've got, given the allies that we've got, what would war look like in this region? I think it'd be far worse than anything in the 20th century. Far worse. Would it be World War Three? Would we be talking about World War Three? I think it would be, which is why we've got to maintain the peace. Mm. We've got to talk. We've got to continue our dialogue um, with China, but we also have to prepare for any sort of strategic contingency, and that means we have to build up our military capacity. I don't think we're going to see a 1944 D-Day style invasion by China of Taiwan. The Chinese could win it, but it would cost them dearly and, and their military capability would be severely hit by the American forces that sit in South Korea, Japan, Guam, Alaska and Diego Garcia. The United States plays a major strategic role in the Indo-Pacific. With 375,000 personnel, there's a vast network of operations that extend from Hawaii all the way to India. Jim Molan believed China's first course of action would be to aim big. So what is your code red warning? My code red warning is a, is a surprise attack by China uh, on American facilities in the vicinity of Taiwan. So you think they'll neutralise the enemy, so to speak, uh, outside of Taiwan? before going into Taiwan itself. Uh, correct. I believe they will neutralise the Americans, dominate the Western Pacific and say to Taiwan, OK, Taiwan, OK, Japan, OK, South Korea, are you, gonna are you really going to fight us now that the Americans aren't behind you anymore? And I've been saying that we should prepare for a war between China and the United States with us as collateral, not the main aim, we're collateral. And fundamentally, the Chinese now have the capability to take out uh, all our communications and uh, space capabilities across the entire spectrum of space. Uh, the, use of, the use of space and communications in the military at the moment is absolutely critical. When it comes to space, China was late to the game, but has very quickly caught up. Their ambitious space program now leads the world in annual rocket launches. China now has more than 360 satellites orbiting the Earth. The Chinese are rehearsing and practising this all the time, taking out the, the world's, not just the Americans, the world's satellites up there. Uh, they're rehearsing this all the time. If they took out the world's satellites, the undersea cables, if they attacked American military bases, which are not fortified in the, in the American bases around Taiwan, then there is nothing the Americans can do. If Australia was to get involved in any potential war here in Taiwan, would we then potentially get attacked from Chinese forces? China won't be able to attack Australia unless they have Taiwan. That's for sure. So, but once Taiwan is done, the Australia could be the next target. From a military point of view then, are we ready for war? I don't think we are. A case in point is our active Defence Force personnel. <laughs> Combining its one million troops with other personnel, China has over two million. America, around 1.4 million. Australia, 60,000. There's a plan to get us to 80,000. Is that enough? Growing the Defence Force by 20,000 people over the next two decades, that's a, that's a big target. And we definitely need the people to crew submarines, to, to conduct cyber capabilities and operations, uh, to do a number of the emerging jobs that probably don't exist yet, but will in 10 years or so. 
But I think recruitment and then retention is the biggest challenge we face in the Defence Force. How weakened have our Defence Forces become? Well, it doesn't take long for a military organisation to lose readiness when it's not able to practise what it does. A more immediate issue for the ADF is its current state of readiness. In recent years, nearly one third of our defence forces have been tied up with natural disasters and the COVID pandemic. When we respond to uh, large scale disasters here and overseas, it takes away defence assets. And when you have large amphibious ships and large parts of the army cleaning up after floods, fighting bushfires or overseas, they're not able to train for what is their principal role, which is to be a deterrent against threats against Australia or to respond to those threats in a military way. Right. Whose fault's that? Well, obviously it's the government. I mean, they're the ones who make these calls. That probably was not the right thing to be doing because we now have a military that is a lower readiness than it needs to be. Ready or not, the ADF now faces major challenges. We do need to be thinking about whether or not the defence force we have now is, is fit in, in terms of the strategic landscape that we face, and it is very different. Um, there is much greater threat. We must have the ability to project, to project sure. power. We need to be able to hold any potential adversary at risk uh, at greater distance from our shores. <laughs>